Hi everyone, and welcome to NCARB Live. I'm Samantha Miller, and I'm joined by two experts from our examination team, Ryan Meisner and Jared Zern. So today we'll be talking about all things 5.0, including how to make the switch from 4.0, what candidates are saying about the new exam, and updates to the cut score process. Now, as always, we'll have about 30 minutes at the end for a Q&A, so if you have any questions, feel free to submit them using the Q&A tool on your screen. And remember, you can get real-time help from our experts at any time through the ARE 5.0 community, and that's at ncarb.org slash ARE5community. So to kick things off, can you give us an update on the technical issue that some candidates experienced yesterday? Sure, I'll, st I'll start with that one. Um, Actually, Ryan and I were really looking forward to doing this NCARB Live because we were going to talk to you about all the great things that were happening with cut score, yeah. especially related to project planning and design. And then yesterday, something really bad happened. I mean, there, it's unfortunate, but what ended up happening was some of our candidates in test centers experienced an ARE 5.0 exam shutdown, and it impacted about 40% of the candidates that did test yesterday. Um, but the good news is we've worked with our vendors to already get things reset. They had service restored by uh, end of day yesterday, so some candidates were able to complete their exams. But we know that there's, you know, there are several people out there that right now are waiting to get rescheduled to go in and retest. So just before NCARB Live, Ryan and I have been scurrying around actually quite a bit yesterday afternoon yeah. and today, uh, getting answers for the candidates. And the emails went out probably about an hour, hour and a half ago, explaining to each impacted candidate what really happened um, and then how we're going to work with them to get everything reset moving forward. Yeah. Okay. We posted an update onto the community, but as Jared said, it was really about those candidates that were impacted and they've been contacted directly already. Yeah. So the details of what happened were that when candidates go to the Prometric Test Center to test, they actually then gain access to the test driver, which is a web-based driver. And we've been talking about that on our blog posts and things like that. And the problem was with the web-based driver, which is outside of the Prometric network. But when it had an issue, then Prometric was no longer able to deliver the exams at that moment. So I will say, NCARB does not ever want candidates to have this type of experience. I was happy with how our team responded to this yesterday. Prometric uh, called me, I think, within minutes of the first real candidate and the second candidate happening. And then we reached out to our other vendors, got everybody on the phone, started changing emails like crazy to figure out what was happening, how do we get the thing turned back on as fast as possible, which was about 90 minutes. Yeah. To, to restoration, and then since that time, now we've been working on, okay, how do we, what do we do and what do we have to do to really get all of those candidates reset? Because what we know is some of you were actually really close to being done, some of you hadn't even started. There was a lot of things happening at the same time, and those are all of the answers we're now starting to get back out to candidates, because we've actually just got some of those answers ourselves. Yeah, and for those candidates that were impacted and contacted customer service, thank you, because that was exactly the right thing to do. Posting things on the community, great. That's a way to vent or to let some information out. But the reality is that anytime you have an issue in the test center, your first action as soon as you get out of the, the test center is to contact NCARB customer service. That allows us to respond to you as an individual and really investigate the issue at a personal level and um, you know reduce that time of impact as much as possible. So thank you to those that, that addressed customer service. All right, well, thank you for that update. So let's switch gears and talk about updates to the cut score process. Yeah, so the cut score process has started in a couple of our divisions already. And that first one that we've started on is PPD, so Project Planning and Design. We've gotten to enough candidate administrations that we've started that process. In fact, Jared and I met with the, the first group that were uh, weighing in on this process and working on the cut score. Uh, this past weekend, we were down in Charlotte, North Carolina and had people in there and we worked through the process. Our psychometricians are now uh, working through that data. We've got a couple other calls that eventually goes to the board of directors next week where a final decision will be made. At that time, we can start scoring all of those exams and we fully expect to get uh, all of the cuts, all of the score reports for PPD out by mid-February. And we're really shooting for mid-February on that. And then as soon as those are released, that first batch that goes out, everybody that's been waiting, from then on, everything will just roll for that division. Uh, uh, the rest of our divisions, we're constantly posting uh, updates to that administration chart on the ARI 5.0 community. You'll see that another update was made today, PDD, so our next long division, that's at that uh, enough administration scheduled through the end of February. So we haven't quite started the process yet, 
we have enough administrations scheduled, we need for people to go ahead and take some of those administrations, and then the same thing will happen. We'll host that meeting, it'll go through a couple other steps, and then those score reports should be out by, we're hoping, I think, mid, mid-March to maybe late March. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reality is practice management isn't that far behind either. So those three divisions, we're really hoping to have all of the cut, the score reports out and the cut score set by the end of March. Yeah. The other thing that happened is, as you know, there was a big announcement last week about an additional incentive, and it was very clear based on the way we're tracking data that that incentive is mattering to the candidates. Yeah. So we had a, a substantial number of administrations scheduled for the month of February. Again, um, anybody who's in the five divisions that have not gone through cut score yet, so any division except PPD, they're all guaranteed the early tester incentives. And we, I will tell you, have totally exceeded the 600 in that division, but everybody's still gonna get the incentive. So what are those incentives for our candidates who might not have heard about them? Okay, well the first incentive is the one that's been out there the entire time, and that's when you are an early tester, $100 gift card. All you have to do is show up, take your exam, it doesn't matter whether you pass, whether you fail, it's not about scheduling, it's about actually getting in and taking that exam, and you get a $100 gift card courtesy of NCARB, and that can be used anywhere. And the one that was just announced last week was what we were hearing from candidates as we were out talking after 5.0 was launched is sort of this still this unknown about 5.0. So there's there was a hesitation to wanting to go in and take this new exam. And you know, Ryan and I have been talking a lot about it, but again, we know we have the inside knowledge and we've seen all these items and we've seen how the forms got assembled. So we were comfortable with 5.0 going, yeah, it's a good exam, get in there and test. We understand you didn't have that luxury that we had. So we offered this additional incentive where now if you're an early tester and it just so happens that you do fail, unfortunately, after the cut score is set, then we're gonna give you a free test. So you'll be able to use that free test to either go back in and retest on the division that you weren't successful at or use it to test on any other of your 5.0 divisions still remaining. And a lot of candidates are pretty excited about that recent addition. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. You can take advantage of it on as many divisions as you want. So if you test for all six divisions, you're going to get six gift cards. If you uh, test for all six divisions and end up failing two of them, you're still going to get two of those retests for free. So take advantage of it on us. So about how many candidates have transitioned to 5.0? So as of, I was looking at numbers today coming into this, uh, as of today, we have over 2,000 candidates that have transitioned from 4.0 to 5.0. We have another about 800 candidates that are just new to 5.0 altogether. So that's our active airy 5.0 candidate population with eligibilities. Yeah. So anybody that's starting new, if you go in tomorrow and get eligibilities to begin testing, you're gonna be in that 800 number, you're gonna be a 5.0 candidate but then any other candidate that's had past eligibilities, you can go into your NCARB record anytime and hit that transition button and and transition over to 5.0. So what are eligibilities for those of our viewers who don't know? Sure, we've talked about eligibilities on some of our other NCARB lives, and really what your eligibility is, is it's your ticket to test. So your eligibility, you come to your NCARB record, You go to the exams tab and you request your eligibilities. And then depending on which jurisdiction you're testing under, either NCARB will turn those eligibilities on on behalf of the jurisdiction, or in some jurisdictions we know the jurisdiction manages their eligibilities independently, so then they go in and eventually turn on your eligibilities for you. But if you can log in and you can see that schedule link, you know you have your eligibilities to test. Yep. So we recently polled candidates who have already taken a division of 5.0 and 88% of respondents said that they recommend transitioning to 5.0. What are some of the things that people are saying about the exam on the community, both good and bad? Um, well, I think one of the things that we hear, so I'm on the community a lot, I'm Ryan and Carb, hello, uh, and my team, Nick and Michelle, and, and the rest of us here at NCARB are on the community quite a bit. And we do, we see mixed reviews on it, but one of the things that we do keep hearing about is the interface, both good and bad. Um, It's certainly a lot cleaner interface than 4.0. There have been a lot of improvements that have been made. Um, It's cleaner in that sense. There's no vignettes. There's no special software that you have to learn to use. The hotspots and the drag and place items, people seem to really like those. They seem to be intuitive as an item type. Not a lot of work has to go in beforehand to really figure those out. So those are good things that we're hearing. Um, We're also hearing good things about the case studies. People seem to like the case studies. In fact, what I've heard from a, call, a couple different instances that it's they, they like it because it's the way they practice. It's resources, it's finding the right information, synthesizing some of that information, and then answering the question. So they like that aspect of it. 
Now, on the flip side, there are a few things that we've heard that right. people aren't as happy about, and that's okay. Um, some of those have to do with uh, the navigation, the loading of the screens, those type of things. And those are all expected, right? I mean, these are things that we knew when we were launching 5.0. Right. One of the one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we've received is that candidates are, are as they're navigating from one item to the next, as the second item is loading and then the third item is loading, that there is a slight delay between each question. And that actually was expected when we tested this system because we, we did multiple, multiple tests on this system. And, and all across the country too, not just here in DC, right. we did them all across the country. Right. We, did, we had volunteers pilot testing for us all over the place and getting yeah. feedback and tracking all of this data. And what we do know is that that is, that is the expected behavior because it's a web-based delivery system like we had mentioned earlier. So just as if you're sitting at home clicking on one web page and then jumping to another web page and then jumping to another web page, it has to refresh every time. That same behavior is happening inside of the test center. Now all of that timing was built into the overall block of time that we allotted for each of the divisions. And we are hearing though that candidates, a lot of candidates are saying that they're having a hard time getting done with the exam in time, or they're feeling time pressure at least. They're getting done, but there's definitely a level of pressure there. So a couple of points on that that we wanted to point out. One, that's actually information we use to help set the cut score. So I know some candidates were, were thinking that this exam is going to be harder because they felt time pressure. Well, the reality is, Ron and I just witnessed it this last weekend with our cut score panelists. They all had to sit down and take that same exact exam that you did yeah. in the same time constraints. And we do that on purpose, so that way when they're making judgments about you know, what the cut score should be, they're making a fair judgment based on the same condition that you had to experience as a candidate. So from a timing perspective, that's something where, yes, test strategies matter, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but that's probably one of the biggest pieces of feedback we've got is time and time management. We want to help you get better at test taking strategies mm -hmm. so you can navigate through and not feel that pressure at the end, but from a, from a delivery perspective, the, the, um, the time between questions is as expected. Yeah. And you can uh, play around with the tools and experience what you'll experience at the test center through the demo exam. Absolutely. Correct. What is available in the demo exam is exactly what you're going to get in the test center. So, um, you know, we said this during, when it came to vignettes, practice the vignettes, that way you knew the software, you didn't have to mess with trying to figure out where an offset key was, and there's not an offset key. So just make sure you know how to use it. That way when you're in the test center, you're focused on answering the questions and not dealing with the interface. Now one other thing that we have heard back on is the calculator, right? Absolutely. And the calculator has been a bit of a frustration for some people. We hear that, we understand that. We're actually working on that as well. So. When we're able to turn on the uh, the number pad as a, as a part of that, we will certainly let everyone know. Um, but it's just it's something that uh, was a limitation to begin with, and we're, and we're working on it and looking into it now. Right. This is really where we can get into the weeds on this. But Ryan and I, when we were doing some of the pilot testing, the calculator and the number pad actually was enabled at first, and we were using it in the test center that mm -hmm. way. And then that led to some other issues. You'd be amazed how things are also interconnected, at which point it had to be disabled for the exam, for the purpose of the exam, but now we're working on getting that corrected, and that's been underway. Yeah. Um, we are hoping to announce that very, very soon, that the number pad is now available. And it's a little thing, but we know it's gonna, it's gonna help you in the test center, yeah. and that's why we're gonna keep working on these things. Yeah. Um, Jared started to talk about exam strategies, and, and hopefully we get some more questions on that as well from people about, about ways to really approach and attack the exams so that, again, you're focusing on content and you're not focusing on tools or, or how to navigate stuff. So you had both mentioned the cut score process mm -hmm. and that you were both at a committee meeting this past mm -hmm. weekend. Who's on this committee? That's a great question. So this co this uh, this committee, this first committee that took a look at it, was really a cross-section of the profession. It included educators. It included uh, more seasoned architects, people between that five to 15 years or so. It included members of our member boards, because those are the people, the jurisdictions are actually the ones that license individuals, so they're an important voice to have at that table. And then it also included a pretty good set of recently licensed, people that have been licensed within the last five years. And that is an important group for us because they really help provide a check as to, well, this is something that a recently licensed individual should or shouldn't know. And so through that whole cross-section, including, um, you know, geographical regions, size of firms, demographics, all these things, we try and put together a panel that's really representative of the profession. 
And then that provides a good solid feedback on this is the appropriate amount of knowledge that a recently licensed individual person right at that point of licensure should know. Again, it's we're not looking for the 40 year architect and we're not looking for somebody right out of school. It's right at that point of licensure. Great. So we're going to switch gears and answer some of your questions. And remember, if you have any, you can submit them on your screen using the Q&A tool. So our first question comes from Javier. He says he's already passed CD, PPP, and SPD. Uh, those exams are in 4.0. And he'd like to switch to the 5.0 format. When he starts taking 5.0, does his rolling clock start again for the 4.0 exams? It does not. So this is a very important decision. Now, it sounds like you're in a really good place, though. If you're, if you're done with CDS, PPP, and SPD, if you were to transition to 5.0, you would only have the two divisions remaining to complete. Mm -hmm. But your rolling clock, as it was applied to those three divisions, is going to carry forward. Yeah. And you will see this. One of the very helpful tools we have built into your record is the transition calculator. Go use the transition calculator and it will show you exactly how those credits are gonna be populated and the expiration date for those credits. That way you can plan your best strategy to get done. Yeah, and really make an informed decision about when the best time is to transition. Great. Our next question comes from Wade. What is being done to prevent yesterday's technical issue from happening again? A lot. Okay, so Wade, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, right, you know, that I did not have a good day yesterday. Let's be honest, yeah. right? And it, even this morning, it was a little last night. Little, okay, a little day. Okay, Ryan, we don't have to dwell on it, <laughs> okay. right? But the reality is, no. This, like, in all seriousness, these are big deals to NCAR. This yeah. is not the expectation of how this exam is going to work. So when this happened, we immediately got onto it, and it isn't just fix it. That is not an acceptable answer. It is, okay, fix it. Tell us why it happened, what steps have you implemented so that this never happens again, and then how are we going to audit you to make sure that we never slip down this path again. Yeah. Now, I can't sit here and honestly promise you that something like this will never, never happen again because I don't magically control the world. But what I do know, I know, <laughs> dang it, but what I do know is that this issue and what happened, it was a surprise to all of our testing partners. Nobody expected this to happen. Yeah. They have already, like I said, they dug in, they found it, they fixed it, and they implemented steps so that it never happens again, including an auditing process downstream, because that's the important thing for us. 5.0 is gonna be there for a long time. We're gonna keep making yeah. updates, but we really do want that best experience for candidates when they go in. That's why we went down this path of the new test driver to begin with. Yeah. A few of our viewers have asked about the deadlines for the testing incentives. Sure, we've changed it a little bit. So yeah. early on, when, when we were talking to you, we kept saying, okay, it's gonna be the first 600, the first 600. Mm -hmm. And Ryan and I both experienced candidates getting a little nervous, well, am I a first 600, am I not a first 600? What if I schedule three weeks from now? So we actually changed that strategy. And we said, okay, this isn't working, it's not working for our candidate population, yeah. it's too unknown. So what we switched to were, the, were these new guarantees. And we came out and we said, we'll guarantee if you test, by January 31st, in any of our Area 5.0 divisions, you're an early tester, you're gonna get all of the incentives. Mm -hmm. It got us enough administrations to start the Cutsport process for PPD, yeah. and but it's not for the other. So we have extended that guarantee for the other five divisions until the end of February. Yeah. So that that's kind of the change in dynamics. We're still looking for candidate results, absolutely. On the back end, we're tracking volumes all the time. You're seeing it on the post. Yeah, and seeing it on the post, I think, is another good thing to point out. So if you're an individual and you're trying to decide whether you should schedule an exam or just wait a little bit longer and study, um, hop on the Area 5.0 community. There's a link down at the bottom called Administrations Update, and that has a chart, and it's right up there. It'll tell you when it was last updated and when the next update is expected, and it tells you where we're at in each division. So it kind of gives you a sense that in CNE, we've still probably got a little bit of ways to go, but in like practice management, we're getting close. So if you're kind of at that line, you may want to go ahead and schedule practice management early, get in there, take a test if you're really worried about the incentives and, and taking advantage of those. Right, because you had mentioned earlier that based on the numbers we're now seeing, we think both project development and documentation and practice management are going to be heading into the cut score process near the end of February. So yeah. very likely the incentive for those two divisions are going to end after this next guaranteed period. Yeah. So once all of the cut scores are set, um, you know, months from now, how, how that, not that many months, months from now, just a couple maybe. Months, two two months. Okay. Plur, months plural. All right. Uh, 
How long will it take candidates to receive their scores? Cut scores are set. Cut scores are set. Okay, that means we're just rolling. We're just rolling out the scores. Business is normal at that point. Yes. It'll be within one to two days. The reality is it's much quicker even than in 4.0. Part of that has to do with scoring. We don't, we're no longer having to do batch scoring related to vignettes. So that means we're able to score it much quicker. Uh, some boards may have a delay on score reports being posted. That's the that's the that's up to the board themselves. But the reality is in most instances, one to two days is all it's going to be, and it'll be posted in your NCARB record for you to go and see. Or if you want to wait, you can choose to not click on that <laughs> link and wait for six weeks if you want or whatever it takes. A few of our uh, viewers would like to know if you have a suggested order to take the 5.0 divisions. I, I would say I really don't because this is where it's so unique to you. Now, if you were somebody who was doing the strategic testing, obviously project planning and design and project development and documentation were your two go-to divisions. Um, it appears most candidates started in project planning and design, and then they're rolling over to project development and documentation, and that's perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Um, I think we're noticing a little bit of the same trend. Uh, there's another subset of our candidates that are taking the practice management division that very likely will be taking the project management division next. And again, we're kind of seeing practice management tick up before we see project management tick up. But I actually suggest candidates compare back to their AXP record. Mm -hmm. You gained the experience in this practice area. You've already you know, got your education out of the way, so why not take a look at those divisions as a tester? Yeah, I had a similar conversation with an outreach group that I was I was meeting with last week, and, and a lot of them were a little bit newer out of school, really kind of right into the profession. And so my advice to them, because a lot of them were doing construction administration work. They were on the job site. They were that person who was answering RFIs and were dealing with submittals and that kind of stuff. So take a look at that work that you're doing in the office. Those individuals, the division that makes most sense is construction evaluation, because those things line up. So as Jared said, really take a look at your AXP or even what you're doing in the office right now. And if that's an area that you're working on in the office and you're studying for at the same time, it probably makes a lot of sense to just go ahead and take that division of ARE 5.0 because you're just dealing with a lot of the same content at the same time and you're getting it from multiple ways. Good advice. Our next question comes from Daniel. He has a 4.0 division scheduled. Can he transition to 5.0 before passing that 4.0 division? He cannot. So candidates are either a 4.0 candidate or a 5.0 candidate. So if you do have a 4.0 division scheduled, then you would need to either cancel that exam if you just don't want to take it, um, but you probably do want to take it, which is why you have it scheduled. Um, after that exam is scored, then you would be able to transition into 5.0. If you do choose to cancel your exam, if for whatever reason you're just done with 4.0, ready to move on to 5.0, you would contact NCARB Customer Service, but you should also be aware that that fee is lost. We're not able to just transfer the fee from 4.0 to 5.0. Like Jared said, they're different systems. You can't be both 4.0 and 5.0. So if that's a route that you choose, for whatever reason that's your best decision, just understand that that $210 will be lost or forfeited. Uh, several viewers would like to know if they can use their 4.0 study materials to prep for 5.0. Absolutely. Yeah. There, we know that there's a lot of 4.0 study materials out there. And really the best way to approach it, and again, Ryan and I talked to a lot of candidates about this, is if you start with the 5.0 handbook as an outline of what you're going to be assessed on in a division, you can use that to highlight the areas where you think you need you know, additional study resources. Mm -hmm. Then go to your 4.0 materials and look at just those portions. Now, unfortunately, we do know 4.0 materials don't align super nice and easy. It's not like you're going to find this one chapter aligns with that one thing. But you certainly can go to a section of you know, a third-party test prep material stuff. Look at that to prepare for 5.0. Because again, a lot of the 4.0 questions that are on the exam for 4.0 candidates today have been migrated over to 5.0. Yeah. Our next question is from Marcus. Uh, if you fail a 5.0 division when testing early, do you still have to wait 60 days to retake that division? Yes, you do. Now, Marcus, if the cut score process would last longer than 60 days, once that's completed and you figure out that you have failed a division, then those eligibilities would open up right away. And at that point, you could test immediately. But really, the 60 days is, is, a, is a security measure. So for any of our divisions that you fail and then need to retest, um, once we get past the cut score even, let's say, uh, 
the 60 days is in place still. But the 60 day wait will be there, but it's 60 days from when you tested. So yes, in all honesty, what Ryan was saying was that if you tested on November 5th and you're waiting for your PPD score, and unfortunately after you get your score in mid-February, it's a fail, you will immediately, your eligibility would allow you to be in the test center like right after that if that's what you want to do. Yeah. What about these score reports? Are we providing more feedback on 5.0 versus 4.0? We are. We're, we're providing a little bit different type of feedback. So those of you familiar with a 4.0 uh, score report, you'll know that it has three different divisions. So you're either a 1, which is above that threshold, or 2 or a 3. 2 means you were kind of right at it maybe, and 3 means you probably should spend a little bit more time studying. You didn't do quite as well in that content area. 4.0, we're expanding that to, or sorry, 5.0, we're expanding that feedback to now four different areas. So level one, two, three, or four. And really what it is is two levels above and two levels below what would be considered acceptable. Now, if you're way above, that means you did really great in a particular area, and you may not even need to, to continue studying for that area or refresh a lot less than, than some of the others. If you're in that two, so you're right above the line, but, um, not all the way up in the one. It's kind of hard to describe without visuals. Yeah. Um, but if you're in that two area, it means you were maybe right at it. So one or two questions the next time uh, could possibly put you below. And three is the same way. One or two questions the next time could put you above. So if you're in anywhere between two, three, and four, it's really gives you a better sense of how much you need to study, particularly in a large content, a large percentage content area. And what we also know with the way just 5.0 was structured compared to 4.0, Today, one of the biggest challenges all of our candidates face is when you get level three performance feedback on a vignette. Mm -hmm. And I myself went through the same experience as a candidate when I was testing. You get this report and you literally go, I have absolutely no idea what I did wrong. And so with the fact that the vignettes are going away, it's gonna be much easier for you to interpret your data because all of your data is coming back to you based on our new sections, yeah. which are all these single you know, answers. So it's going to be a lot better. You're going to have a much better sense of really how you did, where your weak areas are, where your strong areas are. Mm -hmm. So let's say you decide to transition to 5.0. You take it. You'd like to switch back to 4.0. Mm -hmm. Can you? You cannot. I like how Ryan pauses so I can deliver mm -hmm. that. Yeah. The right reality is, is again, you're either a 4.0 candidate or a 5.0. And for 5.0, we've always said it's a one-way transition, and we really do mean that, where when you make that choice to transition, yes, you're a 5.0 candidate. Yeah. I think now is a good time to point out, though, 4.0 will be around until June 30th, 2018. So if you are a 4.0 candidate, you're comfortable in 4.0, you maybe just have one or two divisions left, you can go ahead and finish in 4.0 as long as you're done by June 30th, 2018. So that's a commitment NCARB has made. We will keep that exam up and running until that date. And, and you're within your rolling clock. And you're within your rolling yes. clock, absolutely. So yeah, so all other things like that are, are have to be taken into account. And I'll follow up with what you had said earlier, Sam, which is that in our survey out to 5.0 candidates, mm -hmm. the vast majority are coming back and saying, no, it was still the right decision to transition. Because you can hear Ryan and I talk about 5.0 mm -hmm. all the time, but in the end, we understand that what you want to hear from is somebody who's been a 4.0 candidate and been a 5.0 candidate and what did they think. And that's what this survey data is telling us. So that's good. Our next question is from Elizabeth. Uh, will candidates be notified of results via email, like with 4.0? once the cut score process is set? Yes, we're actually gonna do a couple of special things with 5.0 candidates. Uh, when we're up and running in the sort of the normal phase, yep. it'll be just like 4.0 where you'll get an automated email saying, you know, that your score has been posted and you can go check it out. Mm -hmm. But we know with 5.0 and the fact that we're going through the cut score that, you know, there's a little more anxiety around this. So we're actually gonna send you an email just from NCARB first saying, here's where we're at. This is when score reports are gonna be released. You know, here's what you need to know about how it's gonna work. Then you'll know the day that they're gonna be released. You'll be able to go in and check even before the automated email gets yeah. there if you want to. We have a two part question from Ian. Okay. One, who actually writes the ARE questions? And two, and I think this goes back to uh, what you were talking about earlier, are some of the questions that candidates may have seen on 4.0 being transferred to 5.0? Okay, I'll take part one. Okay, Ian, because that's a large part of what my job entails here at NCARB. Uh, I work a lot with our volunteers and the, my team that works with me, we oversee volunteer work. Jared and I, we don't write ARE items. 
trust us. You don't, you don't <laughs> want us to write airy items. We're busy trying to fix things that, when they happen in the test center, yeah. if that happens, um, and respond to things on the ARI 5.0 community. But a large part of what I do and, and my team does is work with our volunteers. So items, both in 4.0 and 5.0, they're written by licensed architects from all across the country. Um, everybody from RLAs in Florida to re seasoned in Minnesota to uh, as educators that are licensed in California, much like that cut score panel, we take a broad section of the profession and those are the people that sit on our committees and write our items. And so they write, we, we staff committees that include writers for all six divisions. Each, each group has their own set of item writers and they write the hotspots, the dragon place, they write the multiple choice, the cat is the Q fibs, and they've done that in 4.0 as well. So that whole effort, which it's a multi-year effort to get an item written and in the test center, but that's all done by volunteers um, here at NCARP. So then part two was to you about, uh, what was it again? Um, our candidates going to see repeat questions oh, yes. from 4.0 on 5.0. The 5 migration of items. So the reality is you might. Um, it all depends on which divisions in 4.0 you've taken, which divisions you're transferring over to in 5.0 that you may still have left. Uh, the reality is we took those 4.0 items and we reviewed every one of them and decided which ones are still valid and align with the ARE 5.0 test specification. And if they did, that 4.0 item was migrated over to 5.0 and became part of the 5.0 item bank. At the same time, there were plenty of 4.0 items that we looked at and went, that item is not aligned with the, the new content outline for ARE 5.0. And then those items stayed in 4.0 and then will be retired as of that June 30th of 2018. And it was done on an item by item basis. It wasn't that we just said, all right, all this large chunk of structural items we're gonna you know, put here. So you may see some of the same items, but also realize they're gonna be in a very different context. So you might be used to studying for structural items in the context of a structural division only about structures. Well, now you might be looking at a structure item, but as part of your PPD exam. And so it has a very different context. So using the same items, but in a different way, different context, they're gonna seem a little bit different to you, but still always goes back to assessing uh, those objectives and those things that need to be assessed uh, per, the test spec, per the test specification. So our next question is from Stephanie. She said she's heard a few candidates who have um, seen some image quality that could have been better. Are we going to improve this or is this something that you're aware of? So it is something that we're definitely aware of. What we do like, we ask that candidates, if they have an image quality issue in the test center, that is something where it's best to reach out directly to customer service because then you can explain exactly what you experienced. You can talk about the image because you can't really do that on the online community because then in a very public forum, you would be revealing yeah. exam content, which fantastically our candidates aren't doing that. What they're yeah. doing is they're saying, oh, they, they had a bad image on a test. And so we've actually responded back on the community. Okay, thanks for letting us know. Please contact customer service and tell us, you know, we obviously know what division you took, but if you can even clue us into, well, it was early in the exam or middle, and then just explain what the item is about. We go back and research that. Again, that's part of what yeah. some of the people on our development team do is they'll check that image quality. They'll find out, is it the problem with the image? Was it a problem with the way it was displayed on that test center? But we've got to kind of dig a little deeper to really work those out. Because we obviously care about image quality. It's a huge deal, yep. especially when you talk about something like a hotspot item or a dragon place. Yeah. We're shooting for good quality. That's why we went with the larger monitors and the Prometric test center so that they can support those for mm -hmm. us. So several candidates say that they've started testing in 4.0, but have not yet passed a division. They are currently not scheduled to take a test. Do they have to pass those tests that they've already failed before they can transition? Does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. And the answer is no, you don't. If you're, if you're having a hard time in 4.0 for whatever reason, maybe you failed a couple exams or it's just the mental block of the vignettes or whatever it may be, if you're sitting kind of at zero, 5.0 might be a really great way to just hit reset and start from the beginning and start with a new exam. It may just be a great way to kind of clean things out, refresh in your own mind and get started. But you don't have to pass any divisions in 4.0 before transitioning to 5.0. Now, if there are a couple divisions in 4.0 that you want to pass in order to earn those credits, you can do that. But again, if you're having trouble in 4.0 for whatever reason, it's not a bad thing to maybe just hit reset transition to 5.0 and, and start in the new version of the exam. 
Uh, a few people are asking about the cost of 5.0 compared to 4.0. Mm -hmm. Well, so we kept the per division price the same from 4.0 to 5.0, and that price is $210 per division. So when you look at it from an overall perspective, it's $1,470 to take all seven divisions of ARE 4.0. It ends up being $1,260 to so. take all six divisions of ARE 5.0. So overall, 5.0 is slightly cheaper from a candidate perspective. Kristen would like to know if NCARB is partnering with companies to make study materials. That's a good question, and the answer is no. We are not specifically partnering with any companies. Now, we've done some stuff even before the launch of 5.0, and we've talked about it on some of our earlier NCARB lives here about what we've done to try and help the test prep company uh, get up to speed. Back in March of last year, so almost a year ago now, we invited all the test prep companies in. We walked through the test specification with them. We allowed them to ask us questions. We gave them as much feedback as we could at that time so that hopefully they were putting out good test prep material for you and so that you could use to study. Um, but as far as any formal partnerships or relationships with test prep companies, for-profit test prep companies, we don't have those and we really can't. As the administrators of the exam, we can't also then be involved in the prep of the exam. So one thing NCARB is looking at, though, is we are looking at developing an auditing type system for third-party test prep, where if a third-party test prep provider, as Ryan said, builds all of the content on their own, because it's not a partnership with NCARB, mm -hmm. they could actually have NCARB review their materials, basically go through an audit process, where we can then give them feedback on, well, this area is strong, that's great, this area is a little bit weaker, um, and then that audit could actually lead to some sort of a, you know, approval from NCARB that they could then advertise all to you as a candidate so you would know, okay, these resources have been vetted by NCARB. Yeah. Because right now, if you ask us, we're going to say that NCARB does not vet any third-party test prep materials. Yeah. Our next question comes from Cordelia. We had mentioned how many candidates had transitioned to 5.0. Do we know off the top of our heads how many active test takers we have in 4.0? Sure. I will give you some general numbers. I yeah. don't have these specifics memorized because they also do change. Uh, the reality is we know that there are about 24,000 people out there that have eligibilities in ARE 4.0. Of those 24,000 people, only about 15 to 16,000 are actually active, active with those, testing, elig yeah. those eligibilities. A lot of them have them and aren't doing anything with them. And this actually comes back to some of the earlier statements Ryan and I were talking about when we were saying we expect ARE 5.0 cut scores to be set in 8 to 10 weeks. And I fully acknowledge I said that because we were looking at all of these candidates yeah. out there with eligibilities and we were thinking if there's 16,000 candidates that are actively testing, when we turn on 5.0 with the fact that you can move away from vignettes, with the fact that there's this incentive out there, we figured there would be a much larger migration into 5.0 early on. It was very surprising to us that even today I sit here and say, well, we now have over 2,000 candidates that had transitioned. I honestly, when looking at the data, thought those 2,000 candidates would have been 5.0 candidates after about a week and a half. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of one of the big learning curves from an NCAR perspective in launching this new exam was, what was it about the launch that candidates did not migrate to the new exam so quickly, which also led to the additional incentive that got announced last week, because we're like, oh, maybe it's anxiety about the unknown. How can we help address that concern? Yeah, yeah it took us a little bit by surprise, and for those waiting for a cut score that tested probably really early, maybe in November, we can understand how the wait is um, less than ideal, but hopefully in the same way, you as candidates feel like we've been at least forthcoming on our information um, about where we are in the process and also just responsive to try and get more people in and, and ease some of those burdens or anxieties about needing to retest or money or study materials or whatever it may be. And we are sending additional surveys out to our candidates to find out maybe why you haven't transitioned or um, you know, what what uh, information you're looking for to yeah. have a study, like Ryan was mentioning. So mm -hmm. if you get one of those surveys, please send your responses to us because that helps us um, develop the tools and resources that we can provide to you 
um, especially in these kinds of webinars. Yeah, absolutely. We take a look at all those survey responses and we use them to help uh, plan our work and kind of our next step and what else we can do to help support candidates because that's really at the end of the day, that's why we are here. Right. Uh, Jared and I and Sam and, and really all of NCARB, it's about helping candidates and we're not uh, launching 5.0 in order to make this difficult for you. We're trying to make this as easy as possible and be as responsive as possible, whether it's study material or an issue in the test center or a Q&A like this. We want to make sure that we're available and we're responsive and that we're helping you out you know, to the best of our abilities. And if you're interested in finding out more about the statistics behind ARI 5.0, I encourage you to look at NCAR by the Numbers. Uh, you can find all of that data with interactive charts at mbtn.ncarb.org. Yeah. So several candidates would like to know about the availability of other study materials. On ncarb.org, we have several resources, including videos on each of the new divisions. We have a very thick ARIA 5.0 handbook. We have the demo exam yep. in my NCARB that we talked about. Where are some other places that candidates can go to find study resources? Um, well, let's go back to the very thick <laughs> ARIA 5.0 handbook. It's like mentioned. 120 pages. It's, I think it's Is like it 170. It's yeah. 170 it's some 200 pages. 200 pages. Um, and this is not a commercial for just the ARI 5.0 handbook, but get the ARI 5.0 handbook because it's really helpful. Um, we went through and went through a big effort of, of putting that together and really outlining, first of all, the content that's covered in each division and not just saying, you know, in confusing terms, this is the specific assessment objective, but really then trying to break it down into a narrative of what that really means so that you as a candidate hopefully have a good sense when you look through that, all right, this is what they're talking about with that assessment objective. At the end of each division within that handbook, uh, there are a list of three to five really good resources to start studying. And then at the end of that, the whole document, I think it starts on page like 165 or something like that, there's, there's a matrix and it goes through and it lists a bunch of different books and it talks about which divisions that book is appropriate to study for. So that is just a really good place to start with your studying. Um, I would challenge the fact that you don't even need uh, for-profit test prep company stuff to, in order to study for this exam. I think that if you structure your studying and use that handbook, go through and look at each objective by je objective and say, hey, I know how to do that one. I've been doing it in my office for five years. I don't, I don't need help on that one. But this next one, I don't really know that much about. I'm going to go to a specific resource. I'm going to study on that. I'm not going to read the entire resource because that's kind of a waste of time right. as well. But I'm going to study that assessment objective, make sure I understand that better. And then that's all you need to do when it comes to studying. Um, we've said it before, I'll say it again, focus on the content, not on the questions. Focus on exam content, and really the assessment objectives and what it is that you're studying, not specific practice questions. Because practice questions is just an example of something you might get. Whereas if you understand a content area, you're ready for more multiple questions in that area. Right. And the other thing I will add to that is then come to the community. Uh, I think one of the other yeah. things that has surprised us since the launch of the exam is we initially launched the community prior to the launch of the exam so we could start answering questions about it. And we figured, especially after November 1, that the nature of the community would really switch to more of a study resource. And I have a question about this objective. What does this mean? You know, where can I go to find a little more information? Personally, if I was going through the handbook and saw an objective I didn't understand, I'm not going to go try to track down a big long resource to read. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the community and ask somebody else, hey, what is this objective about? Yeah. Can somebody help me understand it? So again, we're hoping that the community shifts also to a, a study resource for the candidates. Yeah. There's a place on the community where you can post um, sort of calls for discussion groups by area. There's quite a few up there already. Hey, you know, we're in Dallas. I'm looking to study for these exams. Who else is doing that? So sort of a posting board like that. Uh, we talked about the handbook. We talked about the demonstration exam that's available through your NCARB record. There's the videos. So each uh, division has a specific video that gives a high level of, of the content in that division. There's also some item type videos. So you can sort of see visually on the screen how they work even before you practice them in the demo. And then there's two videos, one on navigation, so some tips on how to navigate the exam, and then one on exam strategy. So those are all things 
resources that you can use to help prepare for this exam. We also have a series of blog posts about ah, 5.0 yeah. that these guys write for us. Um, so that's at blog.ncarb.org. Yep. Our next question comes from Joe. He'd like to know if case studies are graded on a pass-fail uh, with that critical failure like vignettes. So they're not. Um, it's actually one of the very important things about the test-taking strategy yeah. is that realize a case study is just a bunch of single items that all reference the same resources. So when it comes time to test, if you want to sort of manage your time, we know that case study items typically are going to take longer to answer than some of the other items you're going to experience throughout the exam. Um, we know some candidates have talked about jumping to the case study right away. Well, the reality is you could end up spending a lot of time and unknowingly let it tick away from you for your first item. So yeah. it was on purpose that we put case studies at the end because in theory, you should navigate through the exam answering all the questions you know, you know very quickly, get to the case study, answer those, and then go back and clean up your exam. Because that's the best way to maximize your point opportunity when testing. Yeah, but I think to continue on that, it, it was on purpose that we put it at the end, but it's also on purpose that you can use the exam summary button down in the lower right-hand corner. If you're the person you just want to dive in and start with the case studies, you can do that. And I think it's also important to, just as a little heads up, the each division is designed so you can't just skip an entire case study, though, because that's right. a lot of points that you're giving up. But approach it strategically. If it's an item that you're gonna, you're, you've already started spending a lot of time on, and you just are pretty sure you're not going to come up with the right answer anyway, skip that item and then go back, mark it for review, go back and look at it at the end of the exam if you have time. Like Jared was saying, maximize the amount of points. That's part of just getting through the exam and being efficient in your test taking. Are we going to extend the rolling clock for people who tested early? We are going to be making adjustments to people's rolling clock that were impacted by the delay in the score reports. So we, we knew that going in. Um, I know those of you who have tested early, you get email updates from us every couple of weeks saying, thank you for being an early tester on such and such a division. Um, and one of the last lines in there we do is we always try to remind you, yes, we're waiting to adjust your rolling clock until after we set the cut score because then we'll know how much you were impacted and we can make an appropriate adjustment. When will I receive my $100 gift card for testing early? About three to four weeks. So we collect a group of names that, that test every couple of weeks. Every week. Yep, every week. We send those off to our third party vendor who distributes all those. So there's a little bit of back and forth. But within three to four weeks, you should first of all hear from us that, hey, thanks for being an early tester. Your gift card's on the way. And then, you know, shortly after that, you should actually receive that physical, I think it's what, black? Visa yeah. gift card right. in the mail because everybody likes having a real piece of mail to open up right. and you can use it anywhere that Visa is accepted. Our next question is from Sheriff who lives in Georgia. Do we have any recommendations for websites where he can form a study group? Uh, well, yeah, first one would be the ARI 5.0 community. Right. Just hop on there. There's a specific area that's I think it's called meetups and study groups or something like that and just send out a call that says, hey, I'm in you know, wherever, Georgia, Atlanta, Macon, whatever it might be, Savannah, uh, is there anyone else in the area that's looking to study? That would be a great place to start. And then I think also just using your local AIA chapters. Um, they have always, in mo <laughs> most AIA chapters have some sort of support related to exams. And that's been the case in 4.0. We know that's the case in 5.0. So if you have a local AIA chapter that you're a part of or that's available to you, I think that's another great place to reach out to. So, and we also know sometimes virtual study groups actually work better because you may just not yeah. have the ability to physically get somewhere to study with somebody. It just doesn't fit into your life schedule. So look at the opportunity to maximize your virtual study opportunities as well, both in 4.0 and 5.0 if you're still a 4.0 candidate. Yeah, there's no reason a study group couldn't be held over Skype from people not just in Georgia but really all over the country right. if you're studying for this same exam and you know, six o'clock Eastern time on a, on a Monday night works for that group to meet up, do it. Go through some study stuff, meet back the next Monday night and uh, kind of figure out you know, what the next thing to study is. Ask your questions to each other and then mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're still having questions, come onto the community and say, we've been meeting, we're still struggling with this issue, what does this really mean? Yeah. Can you quickly walk candidates through how they can go into their record and transition to 5.0? You can't, you can't accidentally transition. 
Right. So the the way it's a really big accident if you do. Yeah. The way it will work is if a candidate logs into their NCARB record and they go to the My Examination tab. If you're a 4.0 candidate, you're going to see a notice at the top of the screen, which is either going to say that you can transition to ARE 5.0, and there'll be a link there where you can go use the transition calculator I mentioned Mm -hmm. earlier to double check, make sure you're going to you you want the credits the right way, and you're not going to get you know impacted by the rolling clock in any negative way. But if you may also see a warning that says you can't transition because somebody like we talked about earlier, if you have an exam scheduled in 4.0, your warning message says, well, you're unable to transition at this time. So really go to your NCARB record, go to the My Exam tab, and right at the top, you're either going to see that transition option or you're going to get a message explaining why you can't. Now, what's the process then? Let's say it's there and I click transition. So it doesn't just automatically transition for you. It does not. So the fail safe hopefully process for us is that when you click the, the I want to transition button, it is then going to show you what your credits are going to look like in 5.0 if you do have any credits that are going to come with you. And then you have to say okay, and then there's actually a little box that pops up where you have to type the word transition in it and then hit okay to acknowledge the fact that you truly do want to transition. So yeah. if you jump to the here's what your credits are going to look like, you haven't actually transitioned yet because you have to acknowledge that fact by typing in the word and hitting yeah. OK. Just close the browser and walk away if you don't want to do it. That's right. And Maybe unplug the computer or whatever no, you need you to do. you don't have to do any of that. OK. And these instructions are also on the community. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there's an article on the community about how to transition, a bunch of screenshots that will walk you right through it as well. Uh, Brian would like to know what reasonable accommodations are available for candidates who fall under the ADA, American Disabilities Act, mm-hmm. and how are they determined? So the which um, accommodations are available, it's actually quite a long list. So I'm, I'm yep. not going to kind of start rattling them off in alphabetical order because that would bore everybody. But <laughs> what I would say is that let's talk about process because that's what's important. If you want to apply for accommodations, simply reach out to NCARB customer service you know, at our email address and request an accommodation for your exam. Mm-hmm. Now, what they are going to do is that we are going to ask you to submit you know, documentation as to why you, know, you need the accommodation. I, most people who have done this before, that you know exactly what I'm talking about. You probably have all the documentation. You would submit that to NCARB. NCARB reviews it. And then the accommodation is established inside of your record. Yeah. So we always like to tell people, too, that if you're waiting for an accommodation, you don't want to schedule an appointment because your accommodation is tied to your exam eligibility. Mm-hmm. So if you schedule an exam today and then we apply an accommodation, let's say a month from now, and then you go into test, from that exam that was scheduled today, it's not linked to the yeah. eligibility correctly. So if you do want accommodations, please contact NCARB Customer Service. We actually have all kinds of accommodations. Mm-hmm. Um, extended time is very common. Additional breaks is also very common. Separate testing room is also available, as well as several others. So please reach out, and we'll work with you on getting those set up. Yep. That's a good question. Brooke would like to know if you can get partial credit for an exam question. For example, a check all that applies. Yeah, um, Brooke, you can't. Sorry. All of our questions are worth one point, and there's no partial question. So whether it's a QFib or a CATA, it's an all or nothing on, on the ARE. And that was true in 4.0, and it carries tr- carries true in 5.0 yeah, as well. Which plays into your exam strategy approach. Absolutely. As, as Ryan yeah. was saying, if you're, if you're struggling with a check all that apply, and you know it, we said check the four, and you've got three, and you're really unsure about that fourth one, That's a great one to mark for review and move on. And you can always come back to it later and then make that fourth option towards the end. Yeah. And I would say, I think it's also worth pointing out, uh, be willing to guess on on all of them. Because if you leave it blank, you're guaranteed to miss it. But if you have three of the four, go ahead and click a fourth one. Even if you aren't entirely confident that that is the fourth one, uh, make a best effort at it because, hey, you may get it right. And it at least increases your chances of getting it right. If you choose to leave just the three, uh, you're, you're guaranteed wrong. to get it wrong. How do I join the ARE 5.0 community? And you should join. You all should. Of, all first of, of all, you should join. And then it's super easy. All you really have to do is go log in and have an NCARB record. Um, that's the only thing. And that's really just have an account uh, set up. And then you can log in and start uh, you know, posting and, and asking questions and responding. Uh, the community is visible to anyone, so if you are just a lurker or someone who just wants to kind of watch from the outside, that's fine as well. But once you want to start engaging, posting, asking questions, um, just simply having an in-card record, it'll prompt you to log in, and you can do that, and you're off and running. Yeah, and let's. So 
when you do have that NCARB record, as Ryan had said, what you're going to see is on the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to see an ARE 5.0 community. Yeah. That's your link. And you simply click that link, it'll take you right in. And since you've navigated to it through your NCARB record, you're already logged into the community. Mm -hmm. So you're already a member. You can start posting questions immediately at that point. Yeah. Our next question comes from Marcus. How long after you transition to 5.0 can you actually schedule a division? So if you were to transition to 5.0 today after this NCARB Live event, your eligibilities would become live as of today in 5.0, which means yeah. you could immediately log in, go through the pay and schedule process, and schedule an exam. So today is Tuesday. Today's Tuesday. Realistically, um, if there's availability in your local test center, you could be testing in 5.0 as early as Saturday. I don't know if that's what you want to do. <laughs> you may want to look at that handbook a little bit first and ask some questions on the community. Yeah. So before we wrap up, because we only have a few more minutes, can both of you share a key takeaway from today's webinar? So I'll start, first of all, my big key takeaway is the exam strategies because, again, I'm hearing a lot of feedback from candidates about timing and I totally understand the challenges that you're experiencing. And I think the more we can help candidates prepare to navigate through this exam, the less stress they're gonna feel, and I think that's a positive. So I really wanna put emphasis back on the blog and the video that actually talk about exam strategies. Using your time wisely really can help. And I'll go back to what we were talking about related to the ARI 5.0 handbook. One of the other things that we've seen on the community is some frustration with available test prep material or maybe the quality of some of the test prep material that's out there by certain companies. Um, and again, I'll go back to challenging you to say that I don't, I don't think you necessarily even need to use that stuff. Use the handbook, really walk through each division, you know, cross out the things that you've just got a good handle on. And you're like, I don't need to study for that because I know it, I do it every day in my office. Highlight the things, mark it up, highlight the things that you wanna spend a little bit more time studying on, use the resources that are provided in the handbook, and then just go study those whole areas. Don't go and read the entire architect's uh, handbook for professional practice, because no. that's gonna be a waste of time. But go and find the specific things on contracts that maybe you need to study, or the specific things on scheduling that you need to study. And just go about it strategically, focused on content over specific items. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. And remember, you can get advice from our exam experts at any time through the ARI 5.0 community. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone.